Hi, welcome once again to third episode of Shifting Focus, uh, a talk with Sanjay Gupta. Uh, I am proud to be a part of DS Group as VP, and uh, I am responsible for its packaging development and purchase function. Here in this show, we invite business leaders, innovators, game changers, and role models who will speak their mind about uh, uh, socio-economic, uh, constitutional, legal, psychological and other issues and way forward arise due to this pandemic. Uh, today, we are really very honored that uh, Mr. Sunil Dugal uh, has uh, accepted our request to join us. Though he doesn't require any introduction, uh, but as a protocol, I will just do it in very brief. Uh, Mr. Dugal is an alumni of prestigious uh, Bits Pilani and uh, I am uh, Calcutta. Uh, he started his career way back in 1981 with Vimco and uh, worked with uh, PepsiCo, PepsiCo also and uh, joined uh, Tabar in, I think, 1995 as a GM. And within a span of seven years, he was elevated to the position of uh, CEO. And uh, uh, he is the, uh, I think, uh, most serving CEO of 17 years with a 134-year-old uh, Ayurvedic turned uh, FMCG giant Dabar. Uh, he was, uh, or I would say, he is instrumental in uh, uh, putting Dabar on a steady growth path of uh, uh, maximizing its revenue, profit, market capitalization, uh, rural as well as uh, overseas uh, penetration, uh, building uh, uh, brand architecture, and uh, efficiency in supply chains. Uh, he was also honored with the various awards from media and industry as the best CEO of Asia. Uh, he was also the uh, member of executive committee of uh, SARC Chamber of uh, Commerce. Uh, as, as I believe and uh, we understand from the industry, apart from all these, he is one of the most humble, uh, sober, simple and uh, thorough gentleman. So, Mr. Dugal, once again, uh, welcome uh, to the show. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Thank you. So, let us start the discussion. Uh, yes. Uh, because your voice is uh, very critical to the industry. So, mm -hmm. uh, first question is on globalization. If you see after uh, 1980, there, is, there has been an upward uh, trend in globalization with the free movement of... Uh, uh, capital, trade, and uh, people across globe and become the engine of prosperity. Uh, in your tenureship also, Dabar has uh, acquired uh, uh, Hobi Group of uh, Turkey, Namaste Group of USA. You did a lot of mergers uh, and acquisitions of uh, Balsara and uh, FAM. Uh, in uh, your, your tenureship and your mentorship, I think uh, Dabar has... Uh, uh, started uh, supplying to nearly 120 countries with uh, manufacturing facilities in eight countries. So uh, my point is uh, and uh, uh, revenue, export revenue is also in two digit, uh, two digit as the well, Dabar is concerned. So this is only about Dabar, but now most of the countries are talking about uh, uh, Atmanibhar or uh, self-dependent, like if you say USA or European Union, so uh, then uh, around 165 countries, including India, are part of WTO. And as data says, uh, around 90% of international trade happens among these 165 countries. So uh, how globalization to localization will impact this industry? Uh, I think uh, I just want to understand this. I think um, for FMCG, globalization will take a little bit of a backseat. I'm talking about Indian FMCG companies. Hmm. Um, foreign uh, FMCG companies are Indian by, by choice because their international businesses are, are, are uh, uh, managed separately. But Indian companies did aggressively go abroad and companies like uh, Dabur and Marico did expand the footprint outside India very aggressively in the 90s and uh, I'm not sorry, early parts of this century. Um, having said that, I think globalization for Indian FMCG will take a pause. 
In the larger context also, globalization would take a pause till people reassess the supply chains and the, the benefits of globalization where, where it's not. But, you know, companies like Indian FMCG, which have a large, very large domestic market, the need for going outside India is comparatively low. Smaller countries have a much greater need of uh, expanding overseas uh, because of the limited size of the domestic market. So it depends where you are. In the context of Indian FMCG, I think companies are going to be very much more circumspect into expanding and putting in uh, capital in uh, overseas markets. They're going to be um, you know, seeing the whole ROI on their investments with a very sharper focus than ever before. Uh, overseas markets will not be seen as a natural extension of the domestic business, but something which they should do only if uh, the opportunity is so visible and very apparent. Uh, the domestic market is continue to, will continue to support, whether it's uh, the pandemic or not. Indian FMCG will remain on a growth, uh, growth track. So I think the lessons learned are that to be very careful. We are living in a very uncertain world. The COVID uh, episode has only exposed the, the vulnerabilities and uh, the changes which are happening outside uh, all over the world and makes the cost of doing business uh, uh, quite high in terms of the risk reward uh, parameters. Sir, don't you feel there need, uh, needs to be a balance between export and import? Yes, but uh, you know, the best way, if, again, I'm speak, it depends upon the industry, but the best way to, for Indian FMCG companies to expand overseas is to create local supply chains. Okay. YDABAR was very successful in uh, building an overseas business is that we did not have a supply chain which came out of India. Um, it was all local because the tariff barriers in, F in FMCG not being an essential commodity in that sense that you, it can be made locally are extremely high. So if you don't have a, a domestic manufacturing base, then in most countries doing, doing uh, businesses becomes very, very costly, especially in the emerging markets. Having said that, uh, there was also the constraint in the efficiency and reliability of a supply chain coming out of India. Now that is slowly being redressed and that's a very important part of the whole change management process in India is to have reliable supply chains coming out of India. To some extent that has been achieved, but a lot more needs to be done. So I think it depends upon the country and the, the, the ecosystem there and many other factors which determine whether we export or whether we manufacture locally. Okay, so it means uh, there is a uh array of uh, hope in India for as far as consumption side is concerned? I think so. I'm not worried about uh, staples consumption. I'm not even worried about discretionary consumption. These are uh, the, the consumption space in India. I mean, there will be some exceptions. Uh, services consumption will be very volatile. For example, consumption of, uh, uh, of services like retail or entertainment, etc. Et will uh, undergo a big change. But if you're talking about bread and butter, staples or even uh, discretionary uh, you know, home appliances, television, uh, these are very, very robust uh, businesses. They may not be the fastest growing or the most exciting, but they offer long-term stable growth and value. So Indian FMCG is uh, the, perhaps the least affected in the whole uh, pandemic. Um, discretionary has been much more because of the closure of the retail outlets, but not in terms of lessening of the inherent demand. Uh, consumer staples also is more uh, secure because the drop in income levels, which is inevitable consequence of the pandemic, will not affect low ticket items as much as the higher ticket. So yes, there will be some uh, some some pain in the short term for discretionary high 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 price discretionary, but uh, uh, not for staples. So I'm very optimistic about the Indian FMCG industry. I don't think this year is going to be a good one. This year. I think if most companies just would break even in terms of sales growth, that would be a decent achievement. So but uh, we, I don't see any long-term uh, pain here. Okay, so good to have your optimistic view on the subject. And then connecting dots, and another question from the financial angle. Uh, how do you see pre- and uh, post-pandemic FMCG industry outlook? Uh, is there a shift from uh, EBITDA to EBITDA P? Uh, like I have added... Uh, earning before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, and pandemic also. Uh, will, uh, not a, will not a, the, uh, bottom line? No, I don't think so. And again, I'm not looking at one, two, three quarters. I'm looking at a longer term perspective. 
I think EBITDA will remain the prime metric here and not uh, EBITDA pre and post pandemic. I don't think there'll be a major alteration in the ratios okay. once the, uh, the the issues are settled, perhaps from next fiscal. So, uh, so, so, but but having said that, this whole uh, EBITDA issues pre and post pandemic may be very relevant to industries which are hugely affected by uh, this this uh, disease and which affects people's behavior. I don't think pandemic will affect people's behavior with regard to consumption of staples. People are still going to brush their teeth and uh, you know eat the same food, etc., etc. Some shifts will happen from branded from unbranded to branded, but those are something which were inevitable in any case. Uh, but let's say in travel, now people are going to people's behavior in travel is going to change. People are not going to travel casually. Uh, they're going to be it's going to be very purposive travel. So which means that the quantum of travel will come down. Uh, the entertainment, people will start watching uh, content at home rather than going to theaters, etc. Uh, hotels, again, a part of the travel industry will, and business travel uh, is going to come down very sharply. Work from home is going to be a, a very, very, very big uh, turnaround in terms of people's behavior. So all these mean that uh, if I was, let's say, that those kind of industries which are going to be structurally changed by the pandemic, I would look at both these ratios, like you said, the <clears throat> a bit of pre and post pandemic, but not not in FMCG and stables. I don't think we should change these very critical ratios. Sir, in economics, we learn that there is a chain reaction. If I earn one rupee, then I will spend one rupee, and then this one rupee will become a two rupees. So, if some of the industry will collapse, uh, how will it affect the whole uh, ecosystem? Well, some industries may collapse um, and then completely get obliterated. For example, uh, while hotels is not going to collapse as an industry, there are going to be many players, the weaker players will collapse. Uh, um, same for travel, same for many other such industries. There will be some consolidation. I don't see that consolidation happening to the same extent in FMCG. Yes, there will be a further acceleration towards uh, branded. And there would be a strengthening of national brands and established players. Uh, perhaps the regional players would uh, feel a little bit of uh, pain. So these shifts will happen. But I don't see collapse happening in any industry, or not even in the services sector, which is uh, you know so so much affected. But there will be shifts, and uh, again, the lead players will be the beneficiaries. Now, an airline. Suppose we have six airlines in India, maybe two or three will survive, and the strongest will survive. Because in a high, in a capital-intensive industry with lower utilization, you cannot have everybody happening. So there will be a lot of pain, a lot of churn. Uh, the fittest will survive. So there may be some structural reforms. Uh, in what? In the way companies behave and operate? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, let me give you one example. In uh, um, since people's behavior is going to change, people are going to avoid congregations. They already have. Uh, the the uh, habit of, uh, be, of which is being inculcated of buying uh, products online is now very hardwired. I think all of us, without exception, have bought more products online than we ever have in the past uh, because uh, it, it means that you can get convenience, you can get good pricing even, you can get a, a huge array of choice without taking any risk of going uh, leaving your home. So. Uh, let's say even in FMCG, where typically two to three percent of sales used to come from e-commerce, I expect this shift to exponentially increase. So e-commerce is perhaps going to become ten percent, maybe twenty percent in the next two, three, four years, and that's a massive, massive change. Uh, the second thing is that availability of products close to home, uh, which means that the local grocer, local uh, you know uh, Kirana person, is now becoming more relevant than he ever had. This uh, entity was losing its relevance pre-pandemic because people are shifting to the big, big box retail, etc. And uh, you know there was a slow shift to e-commerce. So while the e-commerce shift is going to accelerate, the grocer would hold its, his own, uh, perhaps for some more time. Ultimately, the grocer will uh, perhaps not uh, uh, exist in the, with the same strength as it is today. But uh, the grocery uh, shop has got a new lease of life. Um, so then I think companies are going to reject their supply chains. And this is a very fundamental shift which is happening. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, today, if you get at FMCG, which is an industry I'm most familiar with, the biggest problem 
And the biggest pain point, if you talk to CEOs, is the availability of labor. They're saying that we have demand, our supply chains are restored, but we do not have people to run our plants. Uh, one is, of course, the number of people who uh, are available. Secondly, is the fact that we can't run our production lines uh, because of the social distancing uh, requirements. So because of these, our plants are running at 70, 60, 70, 80% capacity when we can run them at 100% on account of the demand side. So there is a supply constraint here, which is very, very apparent, um, unlike uh, many other industries where there is a demand constraint. And FMCG is the reverse. Um, so what people are going to do is they're going to put in uh, CapEx to automate the lines, to require less labor, have more, more productivity. And uh, I think that is our, the FMCG plants are going to look very different. They were uh, very uh, uh, labor intensive because of the availability, for availability of cheap labor, but particularly in areas like packaging. Uh, that's your, uh, you know, one of the areas which you look at. Um, now, suddenly they're going to be looking at automation in every aspect, not just in manufacturing, but also in the packaging, shipping, transportation, warehousing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, thank you so much. Uh, connecting the same topic. Uh, I'm coming to a very, very painful topic now. Uh, uh, this is the issue of reverse migration. Uh, the issue of reverse yes. migration of around 10 crore migrant workers is both worrisome and perplexing. Uh, uh, though they contribute to approximately 10% of our GDP and backbone to manufacturing sector, but are painfully affected, uh, uh, I don't know who is at fault. Uh, and more than that, uh, a good monsoon. Uh, good Ravi crop and increase allocation uh, to 1 lakh crore in Manrega uh, will resist them to come back. Uh, how industry will react to it? So we don't have any infrastructure wherein uh, we could have caged their data. It took around 40 days to start yes. the first Shramik train. It means they are nobody's children. Yeah. So, uh, and think, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been, I think the whole migrant issue has been very poorly managed. Um, the huge lack of understanding amongst uh, the, you know, the authorities about uh, the whole migrant situation and the behavior, etc. Mm. And uh, I, I don't know how it will end. It's, it's, like you said, it's very worrisome, very, very, very perplexing. You have 100 million people who are now back in their villages. Uh, some of them will come back, some of them will not. Mm. Um, some of them, uh, you know, the number of jobs may also become lesser than before because of the automation which I spoke about. Um, but many of them may not want to come back in any case. So now whether Mandreka would satisfy the aspirations of these, you know, 100 rupees a day, the people who are used to earning more and uh, sending surpluses back to the villages is going to satisfy them or whether the government will at a point in time have to start something like universal basic income, which you know, in a sense that means you institutionalize uh, uh, unemployment. Now all this is very good, but if you look at the, 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 the way people's mind works, even if you are getting money and you are able to make ends meet, you know, a young person does not want to be unemployed. He wants to be productively unemployed. He wants to go up in, uh, in life. He wants to earn more, do bigger things. Uh, you know, they all have aspirations and goals. Mm -hmm. If you tell them that, sorry, you will get your 100 rupees a day or 5,000 rupees a month, stay in your village. You will get enough food to eat. You will not starve, mm -hmm. but you have no future. Mm -hmm. it, 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 there is a social uh, issue which is uh, of a very dangerous magnitude that you are stepping on people's aspirations and you are subduing them and that can lead to a lot of unrest. That is what worries me more than anything today as far as India is concerned. It's not GDP, it's not inflation, it is not anything. It is really the fact that our demographic dividend may become a real uh, uh, noose around our neck. Because if you have hundreds of millions of unemployed youth, maybe they're not starving, but uh, they still are not going to be, they're going to be very restive because they are not, uh, you know, the, you are not fulfilling the aspirations. And that can lead to a lot of social unrest. That is something which really worries me. I was studying uh, that unemployment rate was inordinately high in the month of April. It has improved little bit in June. And as per CMI report, around 10 crore of people have lost their jobs in April and May, and most of them are uh, local uh, wage workers. So, yes, if unemployment is there, 
of this tune and there would be a so much of frustration how the uh, industry or the society will work that's why i'm trying to say you know there is no solution to this because you cannot just create jobs in fact the people are going the other way down they are reducing jobs let's say companies uh, you know large companies uh, including the one i worked for we didn't increase manpower for the last 10 years because even though the business grew by 5 6 times or five times in the last 10 years uh, the, the whole mechanization and technology use led to the fact that there was no increase in employment um, now that is only going to accelerate because uh, people are going to reduce their dependence upon uh, labor seeing the fact that uh, in the pandemic labor were the paramount issues uh, immediately post, post the hard lockdown in terms of getting a business back on track so i really worried about this um, uh, unemployment uh, issue especially amongst the youngsters uh, i was talking to one of uh, one of the senior professor in iit delhi uh, we were talking about uh, blockchain artificial intelligence rpa so uh, i was just discussing with him that there has to be a balance between technology and the manpower deployment otherwise the situation if we are going only in one way to to produce more to produce more with reduced cost to the consumer because ultimately it is going to the consumer or to the industry yes. but uh, i think some some mechanism has to be uh, drawn uh, very very scientifically see the, the businesses are very amoral i'm not saying they're immoral they're very amoral their single minded focus is return on capital return on uh, on, on uh, equity Uh, shareholder value improvement they will follow the path of uh, maximizing of shareholder value irrespective of any other consideration mm. so i think um, you can't limit to to business enterprises to generate employment because that is not really what they are programmed to do so so employment increase has to be done through structural mechanisms which only the government and policy uh, interventions can do so one is of course to make india the uh, a much bigger manufacturing hub than what it is today and that is easier said than uh, done because uh, you know building a supply chain etc uh, is a long drawn out process and today with demand destruction across the globe there is going to be so much excess capacity in the existing supply chains that it will take years before that is fully consumed and only after that will people start putting in fresh capital uh, fresh capex and some of that may come to countries like india because people are seeking to diversify the supply chain don't expect it to come tomorrow because in a, in a stressed environment people would like to squeeze the last drop of juice from the existing supply chains rather than to uh, invest fresh capital in building a, a, a completely new supply chain and manufacturing infrastructure so i don't expect a flood of money to come into india manufacturing uh, in a hurry it will come over time uh, but uh, today is uh, is a very bad time to attract capital because uh, of the surplus which exists the slack which exists in the global manufacturing system so there may be a, some opportunity in this adversity uh, in your mentorship dabbar has uh, done extensive work in rural penetration yes And as so much of people have gone back to rural areas and uh, they would have the uh, habit of buying the same products organized products branded products so is there an opportunity for marketers to sell more in these rural areas rather than urban areas because urbanization yeah. is taking a shift i think the the near term uh, future uh, in terms of growth for fmcg companies certainly this year and perhaps uh, into the next is actually now the rural markets now the, because of the, sh- the the sheer number of people going to the rural markets and also the fact that uh, you know narega etc will ultimately drive consumption and particularly consumption of low low value uh, non discretionary items mm-hmm. means that uh, company dab would have a very good opportunity because the rural and the agrarian not the rural economy sorry the agrarian economy is doing very well it's going by 4% which is extraordinarily high by any standards i as the last it will be that's a very lucky part the thing which we are in so that will drive consumption of staples and companies which are able to leverage that which have got the last point reach dabar is certainly one of them should be able to seize that opportunity and capitalize on it having said that while there is a huge amount of volume which you can get there the margin profile of 
products, and you'll be familiar with that, you know, things like the sachets and the pseudo value packs. The margin profile which comes out of the rural market is uh, quite inferior compared to the urban market because the high value semi discretionary products uh, are not sold in rural, right? So uh, there would be some uh, pressure on margins, even though the top line will do well. Uh, hopefully, the top line will grow uh, strongly enough to mitigate the margin impact. But uh, there are two sides of the rural story, and not all of them are positive. Sir, last, my last question is very, very close to my heart. Uh, now, I think it is very evident that uh, nature is punishing us. And uh, next bigger issue is uh, uh, climate change. And uh, I think all of us are responsible to spoil this uh, uh, God-gifted, beautiful ecosystem uh, and uh, planet. So uh, what is the way forward? It is not like that after four or five years, would we, we would be discussing on climate change. I think climate change is a huge issue. And, uh, you know, you, you have not just climate change, you have a whole lot of things, uh, earthquakes uh, and uh, locust attacks and, uh, you know, floods and hurricanes, etc. You name it. So there is something happening in terms of our messing around with the uh, global ecosystem. And uh, that is having its own reaction. <clears throat> uh, one of the only good thing about the pandemic was that it gave the earth a little bit of rest. Um, you know, the, the, the amount of pollution came down, the amount of uh, onslaught on nature came down. But that obviously is not going to last. The moment the pandemic is over, we'll be back to exploiting of, uh, of nature. Uh, and I wonder if uh, human uh, psychology will ever change, uh, that it's me first and it later. Um, and, and uh, so I'm not very optimistic about uh, humans uh, rearranging their uh, thoughts to look at the planet first. Maybe when this pandemic is over, we'll be, it'll be business as usual. I certainly hope not, because it may then uh, we may get into some natural calamity which we can't even imagine, which will make you know something uh, which is much bigger than the pandemic. I think the pandemic is ultimately a creation of uh, nature, yes. uh, which. Uh, was a consequence of us, uh, of, the, of the ruthless exploitation which we have been doing of nature. It was a logical consequence of that. And there could be many others. So the, 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 the natural ecosystem, and many people consider the earth as a living being, uh, it's called Gaia, and uh, they may, and if it's a living being, then the living being may be now beginning to attack its uh, exploiter, which is humans. But sir, I request uh, and believe that uh, industry and the people and we uh, follow people like you who are the leaders. So uh, is it not right that people like you make some kind of consortium and advise, educate the people or the kids or the schools or the colleges or to the industry that uh, if in the waste management is there, if CPCB is there, they are, they are, they are not there. Still, we need to do something for for our earth, nature, nature, mother. So, uh, how, how, how? Yes, I think they should be education, and I think there's a lot of that happening. Schools are becoming now fairly conscious of the fact that uh, we have to be very careful uh, while dealing with uh, nature. But I think there also has to be industrial realization and government intervention. Uh, I'll give you one example: multi-layer packaging. Something which you uh, you know consume a lot, and even Dabur used to consume a lot, and Dustin does consume a lot. Uh, and this is not biodegradable; it has got no economic value. It just clutters up the whole uh, landscape. And uh, so, so why don't we begin here? Now we can educate the consumer not to buy the product. That is far more difficult than having legislation which will prevent the producer from producing this product. Hmm. You get my point. For every million consumer, for every one uh, uh, industry, there are uh, one million consumers. So attack the problem at its source. Force uh, research into this. That how do we make multi-layer film uh, biodegradable, for example? How do we make it recyclable? How do we put economic cost to manufacturers uh, from making it and even consumers from buying it? So they have, ultimately, humans they listen to uh, the economic aspect much more than anything else. And uh, the government, you know, it's two step forward, one step back. You have the environment ministry, you have many other bodies who have uh, been doing uh, work on this, but 
uh, I don't see much outcomes, even though I'm, uh, you know, as uh, all of us are part of the problem, but we all as citizens want to have a solution which will make uh, the world a better place. I think moral responsibility is more important uh, than the, the enforced law system, which is very uh, agile as of uh, Human beings, what they are, I think you can't depend upon moral authority. You have to do both the, the teaching part, uh, put in the moral authority, as well as the legislative part. Put in laws, which can happen. It will not work otherwise. It will not work otherwise. Uh, Mr. Dugal, uh, I'm really very, very thankful to you for uh, uh, giving so much uh, useful insight, uh, which are very useful to the industry. And uh, my my last uh, last question, you already answered, but still I am asking: uh, Are you still hopeful, optimistic, and what is a, what is your message to the industry? I am uh, I am optimistic. I think uh, uh, you know things, but I am optimistic uh, from the point of view of this pandemic uh, becoming now perhaps in one year's time getting over. But I'm not so pessimistic. I'm optimistic about the long-term uh, actions of uh, you know humanity in terms of managing the planet. So to rewind back to what you said, uh, I think we are uh, letting ourselves down. We're letting the planet down in terms of our management of resources, our exploitation of resources, and uh, that it may be too late before we realize that we have reached a point of no return. So that is my only industry, my only uh, uh, thought that we have to, as people and as governments, as citizens, as consumers, find ways to improve the situation, even if it means having some personal sacrifice and to convenience or to cost or to anything else. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. And take care. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Thank you, sir. You too.